Hello and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival, where we are broadcasting live from our new site at the Edinburgh College of Art as part of a new long-term partnership with the University of Edinburgh. As you can see, we are in a beautiful room with the castle behind us. I'm Nadine Aisha Jasser, and I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Maya Rose Craig. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> It's a pleasure to be with Dr. Maya Rose today, talking about her book, We Have a Dream, where we meet 30 indigenous young people and people of color protecting the planet. And it's illustrated beautifully by Sabrina K Khadija. Dr. Maya Rose, AKA Bird Girl, is a British Bangladeshi naturalist, environmentalist, and race activist. And in February 2020, she became the youngest British person to be awarded an honorary doctorate in science from Bristol University. And I feel proud of you, even as I'm introducing you for this, because it's a, it's a wonderful achievement. And that was in recognition of her five years campaigning for diversity in the environmental sector. Her book, We Have a Dream, is Excellent. Her book. <laughs> it's a wonderful collection of stories and wisdom from young indigenous and people of color activists from around the world. And it shares their stories of action, but also their dreams for the future. It's a pleasure to have you here to talk about it. And today we're going to have a chat between Dr. Maya Rose and I, and we're also going to have a reading and presentation. And even at some point, get a little chance to meet some of those activists digitally as well. Um, at the end, we will also have a chance for audience Q&A. So if you are watching at home, please do send us your questions in the chat box. It will be lovely to have you. Thank you. <laughs> so, and thank you as well. <laughs> Thanks to everyone who's here with us. And it's a pleasure to begin. So welcome. Yes. I'm going to start by asking you, um, the theme of this year's book festival is onwards and upwards. So I wonder if you could share any reflections on that theme of moving forwards and moving upwards and how that connects with your book, We Have a Dream. Um, I, I think, firstly, it's a brilliant theme. Um, <laughs> and I think it totally links to the book, especially within the frame of environmental activism. Because um, one of the things I did with the book in particular was that I wanted them all to be young people because I feel like it's this generation, this young generation of activists that are really pushing to create um, a planet that we can still be living on in a few decades' time, um, which I feel like is the epitome of onwards and upwards, really, because it's, um, you know, various children, various teenagers out there who have taken it upon themselves to create a better world, a better planet, to sort of, I suppose, roll with the punches that we've been dealt in terms mm -hmm. of these issues that we're currently dealing with, but to figure out how to build on that and mm -hmm make something better, make it all better, I suppose. Um, and like, I'm an environmental activist, but I think speaking to all these different people over the, you know, series of months that I was interviewing them mm. was one of the most inspirational experiences of my lives because I was just meeting so many people who just cared mm. so much and just wanted to, again, make this world a better place. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think this book totally links in with the theme. And it's like, even hearing you speak about it, the, the passion that is in every page of the book comes across though. And it's, it's that passion that we need because these are urgent times and urgent subject matters, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think, like, because I think, you know, we've got all these issues going on in the mm -hmm. world and sometimes it's really easy to feel like our kids aren't aware of it mm -hmm. or aren't really thinking about it because they're children. Um, I remember hearing this really shocking statistic just a few months ago talking about how in that sort of um, CBBC age range, um, four out of five kids are dealing with eco-anxiety and it hit me hard how aware our kids actually are of these issues going on and probably how hopeless a lot of them feel. Um, so one of the reasons I you know, made this really kid friendly, really accessible was because I wanted children to be able to read it and see people who were children when they started and think actually, I, I can help, I don't have to be helpless, I can make things better, I can take action. Um, and I think, you know, with everything that we're dealing with at the moment, mm. I think having that empowerment, having that inspiration um, is incredibly important. Like a hundred percent. And it, it is that inspiration of action. And, you know, even present in the title, this idea of dream and hope comes through on every single page. And I'm wondering if all of your activists, all 30 of them are wonderful, but how did you go about bringing together this compilation of so many amazing people? 
Um, it's funny actually because when I started write, writing the book I thought it would be quite easy, um, which sounds silly to say now, um, but the whole thought process was behind the book was there's a very small group of activists that we hear about over and over when it comes to climate change, when it comes to environmentalism. And I knew that there were so many amazing people out there doing amazing stuff. And I wanted to find them. Um, and I thought, because there were so many, it would, it would just take me maybe a couple of months. Um, it didn't. I spent the whole of that first lockdown tracking people down. Um, but it was so, so worth it. And, um, you know, I had a few requirements as well. Like, one of the big things for me was that I didn't want everyone just to be talking about the same issue. I wanted to find the people who all had their little niches, their little subjects that they cared about, and that was the thing they were pushing for. Um, and I think that's 100% yeah. what happened. Um, but in the end, um, I think I did what I set out to achieve, which was track people down who otherwise you wouldn't hear about, um, even you know, finding um, translators and things like that so I could interview people. Um, and I think it was 100% worth it. I'm so happy with all the people that I've managed to gather together yeah. into this book. Like, they're all amazing. And I think for me as well, and for anybody who's watching at home or reading at home, you know, it's a, an incredibly inspiring but also informative book, like you say, about all the different things that the individual activists are passionate about. And what we thought would be nice for the event today is to give you a chance to digitally hear directly from some of the contributors themselves what they're passionate about. So we're going to play you a short video where some of the contributors tell you more about their dreams. My dream is to prioritise the environment over the economy. My dream is rest equality for climate activists. My dream is for global climate action. My dream is for a fairer world for future generations. My dream is to inspire environmental action. My dream is for global climate action. My dream is for biodiversity conservation. My dream is global climate justice. My dream is for changes in government policies. My dream is to reshape our future sustainably. My dream is to live in harmony with wildlife. Even just watching that, that made me like, smile. <laughs> <laughs> it does though. I think anyone who's watching at home as well can see that we're just sat here with the biggest <laughs> grins on our face. Um, because it is so lovely to see everybody who's involved in the book. Mm. Um, though what I want to ask, so we've heard about their dreams, but could you tell us a little bit about your dream then um, and what your dream is? Yeah, um, so I, th I mean, there's so many things I want for the future. And I think in writing the book, it was really difficult because when I asked people their dreams, they just sort of talk for like 10, 20 minutes about the future that they wanted to see. And I, I feel like I would do something similar. Um, but I guess um, in, in the book, I say my dream is for a fairer planet, a fairer future. Um, and I think, you know, I absolutely stand by that in the, um, I feel like in terms of solving various environmental issues, in terms of really taking action, we have to fix lots of other issues that we're dealing with on this planet as well, because they're all so totally linked together. And so I think, you know, sustainability and equality and, you know, all these different things, um, you know, we have to focus on them at the same time. And so I guess really um, my dream is just to live in a better world that's better for the animals that live on it and the people that live on it. Yeah, and it, it really struck me reading the book, like you say, about how all the, the, all our different issues that we're experiencing are interconnected, you know, and you have climate activists who are also race activists who are talking about how these are the same things and we're looking for the movement of social justice broadly. And so it was really inspiring to read about those interconnections. Um, and so I was wondering if you could tell me, you mentioned there, you know, we we want to leave the world um, a better place. And I think that's something that one of the activists says there as well, that, you know, that they come in and their thing is, I just want to leave the world a better place than I found it. Mm. So what would some of the direct practical actions be that all of us could take? I'm thinking of some of our young viewers at home, um, that we could begin just taking those steps to trying to do good. Yeah. Um... I mean, I think there's so much that can be done, which in some ways is really good because it means you can do things and like feel like you're helping, um, which I feel like is extremely important in feeling like you know, you're able to cope in some way with these massive issues that we have going on. 
Um, so I think all the little things that you do at home are really important, you know, the things that we talk about all the time, switching your light switches off, when you leave a room, um, not leaving taps running, making sure you're recycling, um, you know, just keeping an eye on your um, consumption, I guess, is really important and it can make a big difference. But I think also, um, which I think is, you know, particularly applies if you can't vote yet, if you can't have your voice heard in that way, is I think as a young person, making sure that you're being heard in other ways. Um, so when I was younger, I wrote to my local MP quite a lot about all the things that I cared about. I sent him letters and emails all the time and he did respond, but by doing that, I was telling him that, you know, people were watching and people care about these issues. Um, I think if you're allowed going on um, Fridays for Future marches and things like that are really important as well. Um, as well as, you know, seeing all the other people around you that care about these issues as well, which I think can really um, boost you up in terms of feeling like other people do care. Um, but I think all that sort of thing, if, if you're old enough, even going online and talking to people about these issues and finding a little community. Um, but I think it's this combination of trying to do good in your own life um, and tr just trying to help, but making sure um, that the big action that we need to be taken is taken as well by our government. Yeah, like, honestly, <laughs> I could just, I could <laughs> listen to you for like hours because I'm just like, yes, yes, yeah, like it's, but it's so wonderful to hear. And there's something that you said there that I just want to pick up on because you talked about making your voice heard. Mm. And it was something that struck me reading through the book that so many of the, the young activists and the young people taking action talk about uh, speaking out about what was affecting their lives or talk about not being heard or talk about big corporations mm. sort of taking really serious action and their voices as local people not being heard. Yeah. Um, so what does this role of, of speaking out, of being heard, of storytelling, which is what you've done in your book, what role does this play, do you think? Um, I think, yeah, storytelling plays such a massive role. Um, and, and you're right, like one of the really common themes while I was interviewing people was, as especially people from indigenous communities around the world actually, was the fact that they had been, their communities were being affected by these really big issues. And it wasn't necessarily that they wanted to, you know, become these big activists. It was that there was a problem going on in their lives and they wanted it to be fixed. Mm. Um, so I think Autumn Peltier, who you can yeah, see her, um, but I think Autumn Peltier was a brilliant example of that. She's from Canada and she was from a community that was struggling with water, basically, something that was incredibly sacred, but also a human necessity. We need to drink clean water. Um, and she was very young when she started her activism, started campaigning, and it was out of necessity. Um, but I think in general, stor storytelling is extremely important. Um, so another reason, like I said earlier, the, re the reason that I wrote this book is because I wanted to amplify the voices of people who weren't being listened to. Um, and I wanted to hear those different life experiences. And a really common theme when I was interviewing these people was just how pleased a lot of them were to have someone to talk to. Um, like there are a few people that, cause you know, I didn't have to interview them for that long to answer all my questions. Cause I just wanted to hear what they were doing. Um, but some people I ended up speaking to for four plus hours, um, just because they wanted to talk and they hadn't had that opportunity before. Um, there was one girl who I'll, I'll actually read out in a minute from India, who was absolutely brilliant. Um, but I asked her one question and she spoke for about 40 minutes um, non-stop because she had so much that she wanted to say, needed to say. Um, so I think, you know, storytelling, telling people stories um, is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, and I think it's something that needs to be done more going forward. Well, honestly, you've, you've achieved a huma, huge amount in presenting this together in your book. You. Um, and like you said, I feel like this is the ideal dream move into, <laughs> into hearing some of their stories, though, through the book. And um, I believe you're going to have a wee reading for us from the book. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think, obviously, the strength of this book is the people in it. Um, and I felt the best way to, you know, explain it was just to read out some of the... Um, you know, bits of writing that go with these people. And then also there are some amazing illustrations. So I wanted to show you guys that as well. Um, but this first one, Lysane, was actually 
the very first, first person I interviewed when I started writing this book. Um, and I spoke to him, and you'll see in a second, but I spoke to him and I was just like, wow, this project is absolutely worth it if there were just 30 people like him out there in the world. Um, but Lysain is from Kenya and his dream is a world without deforestation. Um, and it says, did you know that in the time it takes to say deforestation, a section of forest the size of a football pitch is destroyed? Lysane was 12 years old when he found out that Kenya was losing 500 square kilometres of forest each year, the equivalent of 164 football pitches every day. Lysane loved to play football in the forest near his home, going almost every day, and realised that they could disappear if nothing was done. Planting trees is a great solution to the climate crisis as they absorb carbon dioxide in the air as they grow. Lysane started planting trees at his grandmother's house in Nairobi, but soon he wanted to make a bigger impact, which meant a bigger commitment. He loved football, and so for every goal he scored, he decided to plant a tree, calling his initiative Trees for Goals. Then, Lysane thought, as every goal is a collaborative team effort, what if for every goal scored, he would plant 11 trees, one to represent each player on his team? His football team loved the idea and his school adopted it in their sports team. Soon, they'd planted almost a thousand trees. This experience gave Lysane the confidence to think even bigger. He's now passionate about the possibility of an eco-friendly society. He said, it's up to us to do the best we can to give our planet to our children so they can experience the beautiful nature we have. He plans to reach out to famous football players to help create a forest of trees for gold in each country, in, in each county in Kenya, then a forest and trees for gold in each country in Africa. Lysane believes that football can connect, engage and inspire young people to take action and achieve a greener future. Um, yeah, I, I think Lysane's absolutely brilliant. Um, and I love that, you know, he loves trees, he loves football, and the fact that he managed to combine them, um, I think is absolutely brilliant. And I think that's what passion is. Um, oh, honestly, so good. I'm like, you can read to me forever. <laughs> Please keep going. Um, it's oh yeah, to apologies, by the way. You can probably tell, but I'm slightly ill, so my voice <laughs> is slightly crusty. Um, but this next girl um, is the one I was talking about earlier, actually, who, when I spoke to her, she just spoke for nearly an hour. Um, her name's Achana Sarang. She's from India, from the Karia tribe. And her dream, she said simply, is indigenous rights. Um, when Achana was growing up in her village in Rajampur, her grandfather was a pioneer protector of the forest community. He led the forest protection committee and her father cured illnesses using ingredients from the forest. When Archana's father passed away in 2017, she became interested in activism and research as she wanted to preserve her community's knowledge. Since childhood, her parents told her that to change society, she needed to enter politics and influence decision-making processes. So she went to university and started visiting other tribal communities. She saw how similar they were to hers, how they had an environmentally friendly way of living and how nature was deeply embedded in their lives. Achana shares that, for example, her clan name Sarang means rock in the Karia language and the other clan names include Kiro meaning tiger and Dangdang meaning fish. Achana learned that sustainable solutions like cleaning water and organic farming were being carried out but hadn't been shared outside of different tribal groups. She started to write about community successes and practice that, and shared their traditions, knowledge and practices. Achana joined the United Nations Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change and started advocating for climate action. She says, securing land rights is key to ensuring indigenous communities can contribute to climate action. Archana believes that language must change to demonstrate indigenous people are conserving nature sustainably. 
Indigenous communities need to be the leaders, not the victims of conservation. Forest, nature and land embody their identity. Nature is their mother who has taken care of them and she says that in return, they must take care of her. Yeah, I, I loved talking to her so much. She had so, mu so many interesting things to say that no one else brought up and I thought the perspective that she brought to the environmental crisis was fascinating, talking about how people had created solutions to our issues hundreds or thousands of years ago and that we just needed to ask yeah. was her main point and I thought it was so, so relevant. And also that she's a, like you say, a leader, that Indigenous people are meant to be, mm. you know, the leaders. Leaders. Um, and I really love that. And I, I kind of picture like a little sort of four-year-old Nadine, you know, who I would have been as a young person of colour growing up. Mm. Um, and wish I'd had these stories um, that you're sharing with us now, you know? They would have meant so much to me. Yeah, I'm so glad. And I think that's the goal, really. Um, but this next, um, this next girl I, I talk to, um, was one of my favourites just because she was so sweet and I'm, I'm a bird watcher, I love <laughs> birds. Um, and Ariel, um, who is from China, um, also is very into birds and I loved that. And her dream was to live in harmony with wildlife. So active bird watcher Ariel has seen over 1,500 species of birds and calls herself a birding fanatic. She loves China's vast and diverse landscape and how it's home to an abundance of wildlife. Ariel first became involved in environmental activism at the age of 13 while attending school in Beijing, the capital of China. Encouraged by her parents, she decided to share her passion for her country's wildlife by starting the birding club and inviting classmates to join. Ariel taught lessons, hosted off-campus birding trips, and organized lectures with experts, all of which influenced others to notice the natural world around them. The club members debated topics like why humans should protect animals and the importance of nature conservation. Alongside the birding club, Ariel began the Animals Around project, using cameras to record creatures in their natural habitat. Ariel presented the footage to classmates with the aim of further promoting awareness for the beauty of wildlife. She hoped that they would notice the different wildlife living around them and understand how they could coexist, how the relationship between them and animals could improve. She said, I'm aware that the world is not only for humans to live in, but also for animals. And we must think about them as we live our life and most importantly, how our actions might affect them. We must use our efforts to protect them. Her next step is to talk to people who reside in remote places, living in poor rural communities. These locations have great biodiversity around them and she understands that different communities have different needs. Some might believe that earning money is more important for them than protecting the environment so it's crucial to talk and listen and take the best course of action. Fortunately, Ariel is not alone in her endeavors. She is part of a generation engaged in wildlife conservation across China, giving hope to a country rich in wildlife. Oh my gosh. I feel like, I hope that our like, um, online audience at home are clapping where you are um, or clapping out in the courtyard here because honestly, <coughs> Sorry. it's just, but it's so beautiful to hear you talk about them. Um, and each of these contributors are so, showing so many of their strengths um, and so many of their unique ways. Um, it's just so beautiful to hear, Maya Rose. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, wait, sorry, I need to cough. <laughs> my microphone was muted then um but yeah um like interviewing these people was amazing and i think like like i, like I said earlier but they're all so passionate but i think it really comes through in the pages mm. how much they care mm. um and obviously i have hope for the future mm. as an environmental activist but i truly had hope mm. for the future after writing mm. this book 
Well, the same for me as well after reading it. And I really want to encourage everybody watching at home to check out the book. Um, Maya Rose is going to be doing a signing here afterwards and there's going to be a huge stack of signed copies of the book in the bookshop um, that you can visit online. Because I think for me, um, as a reader, reading through it, it was like, it was almost like a celebration of the, the action being done while still feeling like a really urgent and necessary call to call to action and call to do something like you said you know when we were talking earlier whether it's recycling or writing to your MP your your book kind of holds in in two hands the the inspiration and the call to action and I was wondering about learning and how I think we all learn from each other I think there's things that we can all teach each other no matter how old or how young we are and I was wondering what were some of the things that you learned from the contributors in the book as you got to know them um well yeah I learned so much writing this book um which I which I was expecting but I still enjoyed massively because you're right I think um, going back to your question about storytelling, I think another reason that telling people stories is so important is because we all learn from everyone else's experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for me, the biggest thing was, you know, we, we live in the UK and I think we have a very certain perspective when we're talking about environmental issues, um, which is very Western. It's very centered around the UK because we're from the UK. Um, but I think, you know, one of the most valuable things for me while writing this book was just hearing everyone else's experiences, both in terms of their experiences with environmental issues, the ways that it affected their life, um, but also their experiences in terms of becoming engaged with those issues and deciding that they were going to do something about them. Um, I think also, which you can see even from just the pages about Atana, um, you know, there were some very important perspectives and opinions at play in terms of where we should be going going forwards in terms of environmentalism and this future that we're building back. I think one of the points that was raised quite a lot is that we're pushing towards a better future, a more sustainable future. We're building a better world. Mm. But that needs to be a world that's better for everyone all over the planet. Um, and that's something I, I think about and talk about a lot now, that we need, um, you know, we need equality when pushing um, for a better environmental future, I suppose. No, like 100%. And you, you express it so clearly and so well. And it was actually one of the, the questions that I was thinking of when I was coming to talk to you today is, is about this sense of togetherness in the book, there's a huge sense of coming together and how it's about all of us. It takes all of us to come together because this is our, our planet that we all share as well. Um, and it's a powerful message. And I think, and we saw this, um, and we're gonna move to audience questions briefly. So this'll be my last one, uh, which is so hard because it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Um, but we saw this in the readings that you shared that each of the activists was doing their own specific thing. You know, some people were running to become members of parliament. Some people were organizing in their schools, some people were taking part in the Friday's future movement that you mentioned. So if you're, you know, if I was a young person sat at home um, watching this today and thinking, how do I figure out what action is right for me? How do I do this in my own way, on my own terms? How can we start figuring out what's the right action for us? Mm. Um, I think, oh God, um, I, I think that's a really good question because I think especially well, I think increasingly so we're telling everyone, but kids in included, that we need to figure out what we want to do immediately and we need to go down that path and we need to commit. Um, I've, I'm 19, I've been doing stuff, stuff since I was 11. I've been all over the place over the years. I've been exploring, exploring all sorts of different areas of activism and campaigning, figuring out which issue was the issue that I cared about the most, that I felt like I could you know, talk about for years. Um, and I, I did figure it out eventually, but it took me a long time. And so I guess for people trying to figure out what they, what they care about even, I think just a really healthy exploration of that is the best thing, which maybe is quite a boring answer, but I think that's the truth. Um, and I think you do that by doing, by going out and taking that action that we're talking about and by talking to people about these things. Um, and yeah, I think eventually you will figure out, figure out which thing really calls to you, which thing you could think 
like me, you could talk about for years. <laughs> I love that. And also to say the truth is never boring <laughs> in my experience. Um, and I also think that this book is a wonderful way of, of beginning because you're, you're hearing about so many of the different issues, mm. you know, from water to deforestation, you know, it, it covers so much and it does it so well. But now I'm going to have to stop being selfish with <laughs> hogging you all to myself. And I'm going to share you with our, our lovely audience who have been filtering through some of the questions. Um, so to begin, and I've got a question from Eva. Um, so Eva asks, how can we keep hope and momentum and not give in to paralyzing climate change, doom and gloom? So how can we keep hope um, in a time that is admittedly scary? Yeah, um, I, think, I, I think for me, the, the way that I keep, keep hope, that I you know, feel hopeful for the future is by taking action. Um, so I think you're right, you used the word paralyzing there, and I think it is paralyzing. These issues are so big that it feels like you can't do anything about them at all. And so I think lots of people just sort of avoid thinking about it, which is quite scary in and of itself. Um, so for me, going out and doing, and if, you know, I acknowledge that I'm not single-handedly changing the world, but doing my bit to try and make this world a better place um, is really important to me, and I think, um, you know, that's the same for a lot of people in the book, I think taking action. Um, but I think, if not my book, then I think like hearing about people's stories in general, learning about, you know, everyone else in the world as well that's also doing their own little bit to try and make the world a better place, I think is incredibly inspirational. And it, I think just that feeling of realising, reminding yourself that you're not alone, that, you know, this is, this is major and people are talking about this and people care and people are taking action. Um, I think that's that's the main thing, really. Um, but it is difficult, and you, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge that as well. Yeah, no, like a hundred percent. And I think it's certainly it is that um, that sort of feeling of hope in an otherwise scary situation, knowing that there are others who are, are doing good, mm. and if they're doing good, then then we can do good too. And I think your book has brought that. It's brought thirty, well, thirty-one if we include you. You know, it, it's brought that. Um, so thank you. Okay, next question, and this is from Adam P. So they would like to know, how carbon negative should the planet be? So how carbon negative um, should we be looking at, at getting our, our planet to? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll preface this by saying that I'm no scientist. Um, I mean, we can pretend though. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think, like, I think the phrase carbon negative is a really interesting one. And I think the thing that I'd like to highlight is that this planet doesn't need to be carbon negative at all. Carbon is normal, carbon is healthy on this functioning planet. We don't want to get rid of all of it. And um, we just are producing too much because of the lifestyles that humans are living. And so I think um, quite often when we're talking about carbon negative, negative we're quite often talking about businesses and companies and very occasionally governments and countries. Um, but I think it's really important to acknowledge that this is an issue that humans have created and this is an issue that humans have to cope with, which is why we're trying to suck some of the carbon back out of the out atmosphere. Um, and I, like I've been doing it too during, during the last 40 minutes or so. Um, but I keep on saying, you know, the planet's going to end, the world's going to end. But I think it's really important to highlight that the world isn't going to end. She's going to carry on absolutely, well, for the most part, absolutely fine. Um, it's humans who are the ones that are struggling because of these issues, and it's humans who are trying to fix it. Um, but in terms of how carbon negative we need to be, um, I think... Um, you know, for the most part, it's not really on individual people to be carbon negative. I think maybe being carbon neutral, but I think the most thing really is just keeping an eye on the kind of lifestyles that we're living. Um, you know, trying not to eat too much meat, trying not to, um, I don't know, drive your car everywhere, you know, little things like that. Um, but I think in general, things like carbon negativity, um, like I said before, I think that's the responsibility of big companies and corporations who have suddenly realised that there's been a big mistake and who are urgently trying to fix it. It shouldn't be individual people's responsibility to, you know, be tracking their carbon input. Mm. 
Amazing. And we've got, I feel like actually the next audience question almost kind of um, dovetails on, on the back of that one. Um, so almost like a follow on. And so this is from Lawrence who asks how you feel about international travel and leaving a carbon footprint, which I think is something that a, a lot of folks have, have sort of thought about, you know, navigating um, plane travel and things and, and carbon footprints. Um, yeah, and again, to preface, um, I'll, I'll not lie, I've been very lucky and I've travelled a lot of my life and I've been on a lot of planes and I think it would be disingenuous to not acknowledge that. Um, and I think also, like as a young person on the internet, one of the most interesting experiences for me was um, uh, for a series of uh, months, there was someone who every time I would post would be like, but you've been on a plane, you've been in a plane, you're not allowed to talk about these issues. Um, and it was someone who'd pledged to never fly again, but who be in their youth had fly, flown an awful lot. And I think there's this element of expectation of younger people to be better because the older generations weren't, um, which you can argue the ethics of that, but we do have this, this issue. Um, but I think, Obviously, like I said before, I think it's really important to think about the kinds of lifestyles that we're living. But I think it's also really important to acknowledge that most of these issues aren't really coming from individual people. Um, yeah, 71% of carbon emissions are coming from 100 companies. Mm -hmm. um, and you also have people like celebrities, people like our prime minister, apparently, mm -hmm. um, you know, who are jetting everywhere as well and releasing massive amounts of emissions. Um, and so I think, I, I think it's individ, individual people's decisions on the kind of lifestyles that they want to live, how, many, how much emissions they want to release. But I think when talking about these issues, it's so important to keep in mind the main perpetrators mm -hmm. of our massive amounts of carbon emissions, and it's not mm -hmm. normal people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I really, I think there's something psychic happening between you and the audience questions because <laughs> each one seems to, to sort of dovetail really well to the one before. Um, but as you're saying, you know, there's, there's, it's about, um, and as we see in some of the contributors as well, there's a real focus on action and lobbying, um, you know, your MPs and, and, mm. and talking about the, the big actions of companies. Um, but our last audience question I think that we'll, we'll have is from Matthew. And they wanted to ask, you know, again, climate change is something that feels such a huge threat um, to, to younger and to future generations, um, you know, as, as we touched on just then. But they would also like to know if you think that more action will come from your younger generations in the form of school strikes and other action, do you think that we're going to see an increase in action and activism from younger generations as we go ahead? Yeah, to, yes, to answer your question, I, I absolutely do. And I think actually the volume of action that we've seen from young people has been amazing. And I think it's very e easy to underestimate the power of the youth strikes. But I think people forget what the politics around climate change was like pre Fridays for Future, when it was seen as very almost niche and extreme, almost to be talking, to be going on about climate change all the time, and it has made it mainstream. Um, but I think, like I, it is very corny, but it's very true. I think that these environmental issues are the issue of this generation and possibly this younger generation as well, because they are so urgent mm -hmm. and so um, explicit in terms of. Um, being a threat to our future, I suppose. And I, th I suppose the difference is that um, climate change is no longer this distant thing. Um, we are experiencing the effects of it right now and in this country as well, which I don't think um, lots of people realise we are experiencing climate change in this country in a negative way. Um, and so I think, like lots of young people I talk to, aren't necessarily even enjoying being climate activists, which I think is... Um, you know, a slight stereotype type almost that young people love causing this disruption. There are lots of young people who would love to just be going to school and not be protesting at all. But this issue that feels so urgent, they feel has forced them out into the streets, which I think, again, is a common theme through this as well. Lots of people who didn't necessarily aspire to become activists, mm. but who feel as though they've been forced into that role. Um, and so again, I suppose you can argue the ethics of young people taking the burden of pushing for positive environmental change, positive environmental action. But I absolutely think that young people are going to be key um, to making sure that we continue to have a livable planet. 
And I think it's so, I don't know, I just think it's so important that that everybody's voices are listened to and that sometimes Absolutely. as young people, you know, you feel like you're not being heard. And so it, it's so important that young people are being listened to. Um, and But something else, just to reflect on something you were saying just there as well, you know, so many of the stories in these books start at home. Mm -hmm. You know, climate change came to the activist door. Yeah. They were not seeking seeking this action out. It came to them and they had to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's not an abstract thing. It's, it's personal. Um, and I've got the last, 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 last audience question for you. Um, and it's a good one. It's like a really, a really nice Brilliant. one. Um, so thank you to Gideon for this one. And this one is, what is the best way for young people to share their ideas and concerns and make their voices heard? Yeah, that's a brilliant question to end on. Um, and the great thing is, I think there's lots of different options. And I think um, facilitating yeah, like kids, especially to have these conversations is so important because it's so easy to feel very powerless and very hopeless um, as a young person. Because I think you're constantly told that your voice doesn't matter and your opinion doesn't matter because you can't vote. Um, so I think for older kids, teenagers, I think the internet is a brilliant tool in terms of finding communities of people, especially people your age, who care about these issues and have engaged in these issues and want to talk about them. Um, and I think that's great. That goes massively far in terms of fighting back this feeling of hopelessness. Um, I think for younger kids, um, even just having conversations with them as a parent or a guardian, explicitly talking about these issues, um, what's going on, what can be done to fix them and talking to them like grown-ups I think is very important. Um, like I said before, I think um, facilitating kids to do these little things day to day in the home to help them feel like they're taking action um, and helping is incredibly important. But also lots of schools have um, green clubs and eco-friendly clubs and things like that. I know my school had a recycling team um, that was great. Um, <laughs> um, and you know, again, it was just a bunch of us kids coming together who cared about the issue, mm. wanted to make it better, and were talking about it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think for younger kids, it's not necessarily about the conversations, mm -hmm. but about action and seeing tangibly that we're doing things to make it better. Mm. Um, but I think, yeah, all of the above and more are brilliant, but just acknowledging it and being explicit mm. um, is always very important. But that's a great question, thank you. And, but also, can we say it's a great answer too? <laughs> um, and certainly something that I've taken from what you've just said is that it's about caring about the issues, it's wanting to do something about it, it's talking about it, and then it's acting. You know, it's, it's making that action, whether it is the starting a school recycling club, whether it is writing a letter to your MP, whether it is deciding, you know what, I'm going to become an MP. Um, I think that all of, all of the roots to those journeys and all of the inspiration is something that can be found in this book. Um, and I want to thank you so, so, so much for your time. And just before we go into the, the closing um, remarks and saying goodbye and thank you to you, our audience, I was wondering if you have any final wisdom, either from yourself or from some of the contributors, because I know each contributor on each page shares a piece of final, mm. a final wisdom. Is there any final wisdom you would like to share with our audience watching at home or in the courtyard before we close this afternoon? Because it's been such a joy to have you and to hear, you know, to hear from you. Yeah, it's been lovely to speak with you. Thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone watching. And I suppose the thing to close with really is just that, um, you know, it is terrifying. The state of this world is terrifying. But to keep, to, to remember in our heads and our hearts that this world can be a better place. We can make it better. If we try, we just do have to keep hope and we do have to take action. Um, and yeah, I, I suppose that's it, that I want people to go out and try. Um, mm -hmm. And for any kids watching as well, I think, um, especially as you get older, if you don't think a good enough job is being done, you should go out and do it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, whether that means, um, you know, being a campaigner, being an activist, or deciding you're gonna be the next prime minister. Um, I think, yeah, go and change the world. <laughs>
<laughs> that is the perfect moment to end on. Thank you so much to Dr. Maya Rose Craig, who's joining us, and we'll be signing in the signing tent after this. And like I said, if you're watching at home, you can buy Dr. Maya Rose Craig in the bookshop online. I would like to thank everybody at Edinburgh International Book Festival. And if you've enjoyed this event, it is pay what you can. So please do consider making a donation to the Edinburgh International Book Festival to help us keep putting on these amazing, amazing events. Thank you so much, Dr. Maya Rose Craig. Please do join us in the signing tent if you're here or buy a copy of Dr. Maya Rose Craig's book in our bookshop online. And thank you to everybody at home and to our wonderful tech team for joining us today. Bye. Thank you.